Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ruben Keeling. I'm the communications advisor here at Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Um, I'm filling in today for Dr. Alice Clark, who is our uh, director of postgrad studies. Um, she might be joining us in a few minutes um, and will be available to answer any questions as well. Uh, yeah, you're, you're very welcome to answer questions as we go. Um, you can just write them in the chat field, direct them uh, to me, and uh, I'll we'll, we'll probably ask ask them at at the end. Um, yeah, just a quick background of who we are. So we're a world leading research institute that aims to provide uh, to improve medical diagnosis and treatment of injury and disease. Uh, we have a lot of focus on research excellence and commercialization as well to, to add value to society and the global economy. Uh, we have a lot of strengths. We have a lot of very well known and respected research leaders working in advanced facilities. Our degrees are research based and we have a lot of international collaborations. We have, as I said, we have a focus on commercialization, commercial development based on the research that we do here. And we have many successful spin out companies, startup companies based on that research. Uh, we have a lot of support for our students. We have grants, scholarships, uh, and also like a student support fund, um, which are ex exclusive to us. And uh, we, we take a leadership role in the New Zealand medtech industry, and we host the medtech core, yeah, and um, we link a lot of researchers, universities, industry, government across the country. We have more than twenty research groups. You're, you're going to hear from just a few of those today. Uh, we kind of group them into four themes: medical devices, instrumentation, biomimetics, and augmented human technologies engineering for clinical technologies and com computational and experimental physiology. Uh, yes, like I said, you can ask questions at any time. If you have any other questions afterwards, you can use this uh, email address to contact our postgrad office. And so I will we'll start with Brian. Are you there? If I, uh, Ruben? Oops. Once you've got your screen unshared, then stop share. There we go. Yeah. So, hi everybody. Thanks for coming along today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that's going on in my research group, centered around new actuators for healthcare applications and devices that use these actuators. So. The core underlying idea is that much of our technology is limited by the performance of the actuators that we have. So for instance, we're really good at making vehicles that roll on the ground and operate continuously. But we'd like to move towards something that works more like a, a person or an animal. So we've got these legged robots, but the actuators we have for that are really not so good. And the robots we can build are less capable than humans and animals. Another example would be your classic needle and syringe. That's something that we're pretty good at actuating. You can get a device that, has, that will push on a syringe, but we might want to go needle-free. And to do that, we have to push a lot harder and a lot faster, and the available actuators aren't so good at doing that. The other thing that drives a lot of this work is that within healthcare, manual labor is the norm. If we look at physiotherapy in particular, there's a lot of hands-on contact where a person is physically moving another person. And there's not a lot of value that comes from the human interaction there. It's just the, the specific motions that need to be made. We don't have anything that can do them quickly and cost-effectively compared to a person. And this proves it problematic as our need for healthcare grows as the population ages, and we have more and more people who need healthcare services. We need to find ways to deliver these things without so much manual labor, so that we don't avoid the, so we can avoid the scenario where our entire economy has to be centered around healthcare. 
So to meet these future healthcare needs, we need to develop better motors. And that'll get us the robots that can get through that manual labor. It'll get us the improved technology to overcome the limitations. So we'll have robotic rehabilitation instead of humans. We can have needle-free drug delivery instead of syringes, as well as some other applications I'll talk about. And the, what we look to, like to look at for this is inspiration from nature. The motors that are that drive electrical things, as well as internal combustion engines, are radically different from biology. So we want to think about the architecture of muscles, which are broken up into lots of tiny little units that come together to accomplish the function of a large motor. And at this very small scale, we see transport phenomena taking place that can operate very quickly and very efficiently, and it all gets packed up into a bigger unit. But it's the small part that actually drives the function. And that happens even below the cellular level. You know, these interpenetrating networks that make things happen faster. So we're trying to apply these lessons from nature to actuator design. We want a hierarchical structure where small parts come together to bigger parts, to bigger parts to achieve the overall goal. We want to distribute the power and control of these actuators similarly to how it's done in muscles, so we don't have to rely on a single central controller to do everything. That has to then be wired to everything as well. And we need to get energy in and heat out in order to get the best efficiency and the most power that we can. So what are we doing with this? In my group, we're working on a few different problems. We're doing this by creating new linear motors. So here we've got three examples of different linear motors that have been created within my group. Uh, this one here is what's called a voice coil motor. So you can think of it as the linear equivalent to a DC motor. You put current in, you get force out. Uh, these two here are called linear synchronous motors. They're a little bit more complex to drive, but they can offer much better efficiency than that voice coil. And each of them has been designed to a different purpose. So I'll get to those purposes. But an example is a very small linear synchronous motor moving two kilogram weights around very quickly. So you see some tubes here. Sometimes to get the most performance we can out of the motor, we actually have to drive uh, water or pressurized air through it to help cool it. So you can see it goes faster and faster. And you know, for a small motor weighing 100 grams, throwing around two kilos like this is quite a lot. You're not going to see any standard motors that can do that on their own. So one thing we're doing with this is building exoskeletons. Uh, the device on the left is an ankle exoskeleton that's intended to help people walk more efficiently. And we use a variety of different actuators to control this clutch that determines whether or not a spring is engaged at the bottom of the actuator. On the upper right here, you can see a larger linear motor driving an exoskeleton to help the shoulder for stroke patients. If you give the, them a bit of support to their arm, they're actually much more able to use their arm than they would be otherwise. As I mentioned, we do make needle-free injectors. And the idea here is that we pressurize a fluid drug to a very high pressure and expel it through a very tiny orifice. And the resulting jet, which travels around 150 to 200 meters per second, can penetrate your skin directly without any other thing involved. The only thing that crosses your skin is the drug being injected. And this is much faster and less painful than a standard needle injection. So these are some of the things we've been up to so far. But this being a postgraduate recruitment seminar, the most interesting stuff is what we're going to be up to coming up. So first problem I'm trying to look at is how can we go even further on this muscle analogy? How can we make even more muscle-like motors? And so I have a funded project through the Marsden Fund for a PhD student to help me create these modular motors. So this whole thing is maybe about 10 millimeters across. It brings together a control unit that's miniaturized here. It's only a couple of millimeters wide, the direction into the screen. And a cooling system using liquid metal as the analogy to blood for a robot. If we're building an electric motor, we need 
a working fluid that works with electricity. So instead of using water as in biological blood that carries energy and nutrients in and waste heat out, we're going to use liquid metals. And these are, you know, you, it's a little bit like mercury, but without the toxicity. They're actually stable and non-toxic and they can carry heat very effectively and electricity pretty well too. And we hope that by incorporating that into the design of the motor, we can get something that will have, that will actually be able to truly outperform biological muscle in a wide variety of applications. So we've got some exciting possibilities there to get in the early stage of this design. And you can learn whatever it is you need to learn about the electromagnetics. Anyone who's been through an undergraduate program in biomedical engineering or in mechatronics or mechanical engineering will have the skills needed to work on a project like this. It's not, in fact, not very many electrical students would have the right skills. And depending on your need, your interests and you know, and skill sets, we can determine exactly which aspects of this motor might form the core of your project. Uh, the other problem we really like to look at coming forward is how we can best use these robots that we're designing to deliver effective therapies. It's only, it's one thing to have the robot and build the machine, but if we don't have a good therapy plan for how to use it, it's not going to have the right impact. So we'd like to look at developing new therapy regimens that can take advantage of the new capabilities that we offer in the robot. Uh, don't, have funded, don't have a funded position for a project in this area right now, but very interested in anyone who may have scholarship or other funding to bring to it. So thank you very much for your time on this. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has on the topics. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, this is a great opportunity to ask these people some uh, some questions. So feel free. You can we can ask now or uh, later on. We'll have some more time later. Um, Julie, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie. I'm part of the uh, Misco Scale Modeling Group, and I do have some slides I can share with you. Uh, I put it in slideshow. Yep. Yeah. You can see it. Yes. yes, looks great. Okay. Um so um you probably all know how some of the movies and video games are made using optical motion capture systems. So basically, um, you ask some actors to wear these weird black uniforms and you put some um, retroreflective markers, these little balls there all over the body, and they move while these cameras um, can uh, all around can actually capture the, the markers that you have on, on the suit. And then you can put this movement into an avatar for a movie or for a video game. And most of the movies nowadays actually are, are made this way. And it's a um, very great technology. You can even see a horse with all these markers on in, uh, with the person sitting with a fake gun or fake weapons because everything will be made digital afterwards. It's just to mimic the movement that is actually happening to an avatar. And this technology was actually initially developed to, um, for clinical reasons. So it was developed so that we could understand how people move and how differently people with um, neurological disorders or movement disorders, how different do they move from um, healthy, normal people, we can say. Um, and that's uh, what we call uh, gait analysis. So it's where you ask people to actually walk in the lab back and forth, and then you can understand well uh, what is uh, their joint range of motion at the ankle, knee, and hip, 
And then you can understand compared to a normal population, how someone that had a stroke or um, a child that was born with cerebral palsy, how do they walk differently from others? Um, and so you can see this uh, little child uh, where I put a lot of markers on her, about 40. Uh, it's, it's not easy and it takes some time to actually set up these children and stick all these markers on very, very specific landmarks. Um, you have to understand that you have to be inside. So every time it, it's in a closed lab because the cameras won't, won't work outside, unfortunately. And this whole setup is very expensive. It's like an $800,000 system. And it takes a lot of post-processing. Um, and so when we want to use it in the clinic, and we use it in the clinic, but it, it's very costly. And so we thought maybe we can do something about it, something where we can make it cheaper, um, faster, and we can go outside. And so one thing what we did is that we, you can use inertia measurement units. So it's basically whatever you have in your phone, a gyroscope and accelerometers. And um, on, on this uh, other child, you can see this orange um, wearable sensors. And so there is uh, seven of them, one on uh, the foot, one on the shank, one on the thigh, and one on the pelvis. And you can basically try to replicate what you get inside the lab with an optical motion capture system. It's $10,000 the system. You only have to wrap eight sensors around very quick. You can go outside very fast. The only problem is that because of the accelerators, when you want to understand the position, well, you get some mathematical errors. So it's not, it's not that great. Uh, as we want. And there's still some, some problems with it that we need to work on. Um, and we're still looking at it. The other um, sensors that we use in the clinic is this uh, electromyography sensors that we call EMG. They record muscle activity. So the electrical signal that uh, your muscle actually um, send, the signal they sends when it contracts. And so these sensors can, if you put it on the skin, you just have to stick it on the skin um, about the location of the muscle belly you wanna record. And you can see that you get some, um, some spikes really when, when your muscle activates and then it's kind of a straight line when your muscle is not activated. Um, it's pretty straightforward if you look at it like this graph. But to really understand what is happening, you need to calibrate these sensors. And that's where it starts being complicated. Um, you have to perform a maximum voluntary contraction of the muscle. So here, for example, they're looking at the uh, gluteus maximus, which is the buttocks muscles. And you can see that they ask this participant lying to actually contract her, her muscle and lift her leg up and someone that is restricting her so that she can push as hard as she can. And we can get uh, her maximum voluntary contraction, which is basically, we try to say that it's the maximum force that she can put into your, her muscles to activate it. And so from there, you have this, this nice pick and you can calibrate all this muscle uh, EMG data based on that maximum. But imagine if you have to do it for all the muscles, and basically we usually have eight sensors per leg, so eight muscles per leg, it can take between 30 minutes and an hour to actually get this um, maximum voluntary contractions. And while it, it, it works for healthy adults, it can get pretty complicated when you're dealing with children or uh, with uh, patients that don't really know how to control their muscles anymore, like stroke patients or Parkinson disease patients. They, you, you cannot actually ask them to do all this. So that's where we, we, we still use this, these sensors, but there's a lack of information on what actually they can produce in terms of muscle forces, because we don't have that information. And so the, the PhD that I have available 
is to actually look at these two wearable sensors. Uh, inertia measurement units and EMGs have both their flows. And so we want to use um, machine learning um, workflows to extract the meaningful information from the inertia measurement units and the EMG signals to help it predict what would be the ankle, knee, and hip joint angles, the joint torques, and the individual muscle forces. So that's one of the aim of the PhD. The other aim is to build a deep learning algorithm to scale this IMU and EMG signals uh, based on the patient's anthropometric measurements. So if you have a tall person or a small person, someone that um, might be a bit more heavy than another person, you, you can find some correlation here that you could, a deep learning algorithm might find that might not be that easy for the human height to, to see. And the, and the third goal would be, of course, to evaluate these models uh, to predict the joint angles, moments, and muscle forces unique, uh, using some uh, in-house software that we have. So um, yeah, that's pretty much um, the, yeah, the PhD that we're looking uh, to, well, to get someone to take over and do the, do the work. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, if you want, I do have Ted that joined us. That is also one of the um, investigator in this project, so I can talk a little bit more about it. And I have a PhD student that can talk about her um, experience. She just started, and she did her BME at the University of Auckland, and so. Um, yeah, she can talk about why she did, she, she decided to do a PhD and what she thinks so far about, about it. Um, Ted, do you want to be next? Or no? Sure. Yeah. Sure, I don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so just so, so uh, some f more further information about the project. So um, what we want to do, um, at least for the part that I'm looking at, um, is to try to find a machine learning model to actually sh um, shortcut the process of getting the joint torques, the, the joint angles, because right now, the major problem with these sensors is, as Julie mentioned, is the numerical errors. And one of the numerical errors is um, the integration drift that you get, um, trying to get from your acceleration down to your position and your um, angular velocity down to your orientation. So if we can skip all of this, then it will provide a more robust method of calculating joint angles, joint torques, and that kind of thing, and make these robot sensors more useful in a clinical sense. Uh, I'm not sure what else I can add to it, um, but uh, so the project will entail you to use different types of methods to, to try to figure out what the uh, best approach is. Uh, one approach that we're, we're interested in looking into is to use something called TS Fresh. Um, and that is to um, try to extract features from time series data to create the, uh, these models. Um, this is a, a quite a new uh, method, um, especially to process um, these uh, IMU signals and MG signals. We do have already some students that is um, working with this type of feature extraction and it's getting, and they're getting pretty good results from it so that we were trying to see if we can actually use this to actually look at your IMU and your EMG signals. So yeah, I'm not sure what else I can add to it, but yeah, that's it. Thanks, Ted. Uh, yeah, Laura, thank you, do you want to follow up on your experience and the reasons you chose to do a PhD? Um, yeah, uh, hi everybody, my name's Laura and I just recently started my PhD back in March, working with the musculoskeletal modeling group at the ABI. 
And just to kind of concisely summarize my project, I'm looking to predict bone shape in children and also looking at the variation of bone shape in children with the hopes that this model can then be applied to a cerebral palsy population in order to improve on clinical decision making and implement personalized um, strategies for each child. So as Julie mentioned, I just finished my degree in biomedical engineering last year. So I kind of fell into doing a PhD because it was a continuation of my fourth year research project at the university. And I really enjoyed the work I was doing last year. So I just continued with that. And once I decided that I wanted to do a PhD, I had to improve on my grades a little bit towards the end of last year so I could qualify for the um, University of Auckland scholarship. So that gave me all my costs covered so I have like nothing to worry about and I can just focus on my PhD. Um, I think the main reason that I went into doing a PhD was because I'm really passionate about research and development. So last year I kind of figured out that getting a job in New Zealand in that area is really difficult and I didn't really want to compromise and get a job in something that I wasn't interested in. So a PhD kind of seemed like the perfect way to go. And although I've only been going for about three months, it's been really positive. I've learned a lot and I've really been enjoying what I'm doing. And I just wanted to point out that it's not really like university at all. Cause I remember being like, oh, I don't want to do another three years of uni. I don't know if I can take it, but it's more like a job. And it's actually really enjoyable because you're doing what you want to do. And I think for me, once I finish my PhD, I'm going to be looking at going overseas maybe because I'll be a bit more employable over there. And I think it just really opens up my opportunities for later on. But yeah, if you're kind of like me and you want to work in research kind of thing, then definitely look at the PhD opportunities at the ABI and kind of figure out what you're interested in and see if you want to do it and definitely consider a PhD as a feasible option for once you'll finish university because it's going pretty well so far but yeah that's all I have to add thanks for listening thanks Laura uh, I think that's all for for our group Ruben great thank you thank you guys thank you Laura that was great great to hear from you um, next we have Prasad Cool. Great. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Prasad Babarindagamage, and I'll be talking to you about uh, our research uh, into soft tissue biomechanics. So, this is a two part uh, talk. So, I'll first uh, sort of give you an overview of how we use soft tissue biomechanics in an application. In this case, it's on uh, breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. Uh, Paul Nielsen will then take over, and then he'll uh, give you an overview of our general interests in soft tissue uh, biomechanics and how our research is supporting a number of different applications. So uh, with breast cancer, uh, breast cancer affects one in nine women worldwide and early detection can help with the successful treatment of the disease. Uh, different imaging modalities are used to diagnose uh, breast cancer. These include X-ray mammography, MRI imaging, and ultrasound imaging. And studies have shown that uh, co-locating regions of interest between these different medical images uh, can help strengthen diagnosis of the disease. However, clinicians find it quite challenging to identify, you know, to co-locate regions of interest due to the varying degrees of deformation each imaging procedure is, flying, is applying to the breast. For example, in X-ray mammography, a patient is standing and their, their breast is compressed between two plates. Uh, in MRI, uh, a patient is lying uh, face down uh, in an MRI machine. Uh, during ultrasound imaging, a patient is lying face up with the ultrasound probe, um, you know, contacting the surface of their skin. So these uh, the sort of information that uh, clinicians get from these images is, uh, it makes it very difficult to try and figure out where um, you know, tissues, where bits of tissues, uh, where, how to find corresponding regions between these different uh, tissues. 
So what we aim to do is use uh, biomechanical modeling to help uh, clinicians solve some of these challenges. So what we can do is use these, build these biomechanical uh, models from these images and then use them to simulate the deformation that occurs during each imaging procedure. For example, we could uh, simulate a compression procedure uh, to help figure out where the tumors move during that uh, precision, uh, uh, procedure and then map that information between the different, uh, different types of procedures as well to improve cancer diagnosis. Once a tumor has been identified, it's also very challenging uh, for clinicians to predict where these tumors will move to during different treatment procedures, such as surgery or radiotherapy. And this is partly because uh, these procedures can typically not be done under image guidance. So we can also use these models to predict where the tissues move from these diagnostic images, uh, the positions that, that are used for obtaining these images, to the positions that are used when performing treatment procedures uh, to improve you know, cancer treatment. So together with our clinical uh, collaborators, we've been developing automated breast biomechanics workflows to address these uh, uh, challenges. So this begins by obtaining clinical images uh, from the hospital, and then we can perform a, a series of steps uh, to analyze these images and then provide some information back to the clinicians. So the first step of this workflow is segmentation. It's actually taking these medical images and pulling out the information that we are interested in. In this case, it's the boundaries of the different tissues. And we use a range of different techniques to uh, extract these boundaries, uh, mainly um, uh, very recently related, uh, most of these techniques are related to um, uh, state-of-the-art machine learning techniques for pulling different, uh, these different tissues, such as the skin, uh, the outer rib, the lungs, the pectoral muscles, and uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, extracting uh, tumors from these images. So once we have the segmentation, we, can, we effectively have data uh, that we, you know, at each of the boundaries of the different tissues that we're interested in. The next step of the workflow is to create anatomically accurate uh, models uh, of, of these, of, of the breast and the internal tissues. And we can do these using techniques such as statistical shape modeling. And the idea here is that we can uh, use these techniques to look at the variation in shape across the population and use that to robustly uh, and, and very quickly get an initial fit to, to the data. We can then use uh, more accurate techniques, such as nonlinear geometric fitting, to get really good fits to those surfaces. And once we have those surfaces, we can join them, we can join the different surfaces together and create 3D models of the, of the torso um, and all the internal tissues of the breast. Once we have this anatomical model, we can then perform uh, biomechanics simulations. So here we use large deformation mechanics theory that, al that allows us to simulate the deformation that occurs during different procedures. For example, here, I'm, uh, I'm showing here uh, mammographic, a simulation of mammographic compression, uh, which we can then use for uh, assisting with uh, diagnosis of breast cancer. We can also simulate repositioning of, of the breast of the patient. Uh, so in this case, we can start off in, with a patient in the face down position, such as uh, you know, how they imaged an MRI, and then we can simulate how the tissues would move as the patient is repositioned to when they're lying with their face up on their back. And this can be used to help uh, track tumors uh, between imaging, diagnostic MRI imaging, and uh, you know, surgical or radiotherapy. Uh, treatment procedures. So the final step of this workflow is then uh, developing tools um, to visualize and interact with the new results these, um, these biomechanical simulations are providing. And ultimately what we want to do then is to uh, make, that, make these uh, visualization tools available in the clinic such that clinicians can use them to help improve diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer.
So we've, uh, over the last uh, a number of years, we've, we've developed uh, this workflow, uh, components of this workflow to various stages, and we've implemented a prototype of this uh, at Auckland City Hospital. So we are, uh, we are one of the only people in the world who have this capability at the moment for having a fully automated workflow uh, implemented uh, as a prototype in, um, in the hospital uh, for these breast modeling applications. So here's an example of uh, a clinical tool that we've developed to visualize some of the results. So on the left-hand side here, we can see an MRI image, a diagnostic MRI image, and the associated model that we generated that was uh, acquired in the prone, uh, sorry, it, it, with, the, with the patient in the face down position. And on the right, we have a, a prediction of where the tissues have moved uh, when a patient is lying with their face up, uh, such as during surgery or radiotherapy. And we've really developed this, uh, this uh, interface in a quite close collaboration with our clinical uh, collaborator, Anthony Doyle, uh, who's a radiologist at Auckland City Hospital. And more recently, we've also been working with uh, Dr. Ian Campbell, who's a surgeon. So one of the things we're, we're trying to move towards is also developing new ways of visualizing uh, you know, where tumors are moving. And one, one, one way of doing this is to use mixed reality systems. And uh, for, for example here, uh, we could use a device such as the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, and the idea here is that we can use the sensors on this device to, uh, such as the cameras here, to automatically align our models with the patient during a procedure. And then we could use, we can then project the tumor directly onto the patient uh, to help with, uh, you know, really pinpointing where the tumors are during different, uh, different procedures. And this is a new area of work that we've, uh, we've just begun um, uh, you know, looking at. So overall, here's, uh, here's a look of our, our team. Um, and we have quite a, uh, we have a few members here and also uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, collaborators, both within New Zealand and overseas. And we're really grateful for uh, having funding from a number of uh, funding sources, including the New Zealand Breast Cancer Foundation. Uh, so we have uh, uh, a few funded masters and PhD positions available. Uh, please contact us if you are interested, uh, and we will ha we're happy to uh, discuss, um, you know, any any of your interests in, in what we have shown you. And uh, there's also potential for building some projects based on some of, around some of your interests. Uh, thank you. So now I'll I'll pass on to Paul, who will be talking a little bit more about uh, our general interests in soft tissue biomechanics. Uh, thank you, Ruben. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Prasad. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Prasad. Um, my name is Paul Nielsen, and um, um, I hope you enjoyed uh, Prasad's uh, um, talk about the uh, um, breast uh, research. Um, breast research is, is one of the uh, um, you know, principal areas that we're performing research at the, uh, at the ABI in soft tissue mechanics. But there are other areas that uh, um, you know, we're doing work as well. Um, in particular, um, I think Martin, my colleague Martin Nash talked about uh, heart um, modeling uh, last week. But we're also doing a fair bit of uh, work on skin modeling, modeling of, uh, or uh, experimentation and uh, research in muscle, uh, childbirth and pelvic floor research, um, developing prosthetic limbs, um, and, uh, and lung uh, mechanics. Amongst all of these, uh, these various projects on soft tissue uh, um, um, mechanics, uh, all of them are actually driven by urgent clinical and scientific uh, needs. We're working in these difficult uh, problems uh, in these projects because we're committed to satisfying their needs but also uh, because we have developed unique expertise and tools to make significant contributions to improve uh, people's lives. 
So we are in a unique position here to actually you know, push the edge, the cutting edge of science and, uh, and medicine. Um, that uniqueness is also uh, apparent because we not only have uh, good expertise in, uh, in modeling, ABI is probably the world's best center of uh, physiological modeling, um, but we've got uh, very good experimentation facilities and we have very good um, active laboratories developing mechanical, electronic, optical, and thermal instruments for measuring living tissues. So we are in a unique position to uh, combine the modeling, experimentation, and instrumentation to enhance our um, understanding of how living systems behave, and more importantly, perhaps, allowing us to create better solutions to uh, address uh, injuries and uh, diseases. And I think those, you know, that, that list of capabilities and the fact that we can, uh, we're in a unique position to help people in need uh, really drives the, uh, the, the research and our research in this area. Um, what I thought I'd do is just run over some of the, uh, the projects, the active projects in um, soft tissue mechanics. So the, the first of these, I think, is, uh, is skin. Um, we've been working on uh, skin mechanics for a long time, partly because we just need to get a better understanding of how skin functions, um, but also um, there are many diseases associated and injuries associated with skin that are poorly um, addressed now with current clinical uh, approaches. So to get a better understanding, we've done several things. You can see on the left there is a uh, small micro robot. In fact, that's like a, a little finger that can move around very, very quickly, but it also has the ability to sense uh, the force and torque feedback that your skin gives on the tip. So we can apply this micro robot to a portion of the skin, jiggle it round, and uh, measure the, uh, the forces and torques, and then use our, that's the instrumentation side and the experimentation side, but then we can use our modeling capabilities to uh, infer uh, from those measurements, what the uh, um, skin properties are. As a result, we've also devised some very, very nice image registration uh, methods. Um, these, these techniques, these algorithms, perform uh, over 50 times better than anything else that's been published. As a result of that, we can track the movement of skin without having to apply any markers so you can see a hand down on the, the bottom right there um, without any um, you know, spots or markers put on the hand. Um, using our algorithm, we can very, very accurately track the movement uh, of the skin as a result of the thumb being moved. So why, why do we want to do this? Well, you know, we want to be able to quantify the uh, um, improvement in um, or response to uh, treatment of, for instance, burns victims. Um, if we can do that, then we can better inform the clinicians about whether a treatment is working or whether they should uh, swap to something else. But there are other applications as well, in, including facial animation. We can very accurately track the uh, uh, shapes and movement of, the, of a person's face, and that can be then analyzed and put into realistic facial animation uh, sequences. And as you'll see later too, we're applying these techniques to the development uh, of building better uh, prostheses. Another area that we're very active in is in uh, modeling childbirth and uh, um, developing devices to improve pelvic floor health. Childbirth is a very, very difficult uh, um, problem, or not problem, but uh, um, process to model because, as you can imagine, you know, the stretching of the tissue is very, very uh, large. And of course, because of that, it can lead to tearing of the, uh, of the tissues and subsequent uh, um, you know, um, pelvic floor health problems. 
So we've been working in modeling uh, childbirth for a number of years now. Um, that needs to be improved or further developed so that we can use these models to um, provide better advice to clinicians and mothers as to whether uh, a, a vaginal childbirth is uh, advised um, or whether there is going to uh, be a significant problem. So a caesarean section would be advised. Further down the line, we're also uh, developing instrumentation to um, uh, measure the health of the pelvic floor. What you see down the bottom is a uh, pressure sensor array, which can be used to feed back to women whether they're doing correct pelvic floor exercise. This is really important if you have damage uh, during childbirth, because it's shown that uh, correct pelvic floor exercise can improve the uh, um, um, improve the health of the pelvic floor tremendously. We've actually set up a, a company that is uh, making these um, uh, um, pressure sensor devices. So there's a, a venture into the commercial world uh, based on the work that we have done, the pure research that we have done with our modeling and instrumentation development. Um, another area where we're applying these uh, techniques is uh, getting a better understanding of lung mechanics. You can see down, does my cursor show on the, um, I've got it on the, well, yes, on the yes, bottom, yes. okay, cool. On the bottom left down there, you will see a rather complicated arrangement of uh, um, 12 cameras. This is a, a very unusual stereoscopic system that can image an entire lobe. This is only a rat lung in the center down here, um, but it is using the techniques that we have developed for tracking skin mechanics um, in order to get a better understanding of the mechanics of the lung. Why do we want to do that? Well, because the mechanics of the lung is heavily influenced by its health and age. And sometimes it's very difficult to know what is causing uh, an increase in stiffness, for instance, of the lung and consequently difficulty in breathing. This fundamental work that we're doing here in stereoscopy and mechanics is helping inform uh, what properties are of the uh, of the lung um, are response in response to aging versus response to disease. We're also developing electrical impedance tomography tomographic devices, um, and this is driven by the recent uh, COVID nineteen uh, um, pandemic. Um, we're trying to devise tools that are readily accessible. Um, that can give the uh, clinicians a uh, much clearer picture of how much damage there has been uh, to the lungs as a result of COVID-19 damage. Another area where we have a very strong uh, um, uh, presence is in um, uh, cardiac mechanics. Um, as I say, Marty talked about the modeling side of that last week, but uh, um, we're also doing a fair bit of work on experimental and instrumentation uh, um, development. Um, what you can see here is a, uh, a device that has uh, uh, no other counterpart in the rest of the world. It's a device that can measure the mechanics of very small samples of uh, heart uh, muscle but at the same time, it can measure the heat output. So it gives us a very nice way of getting a better understanding of the fundamental working of uh, heart muscle, and more importantly, how those properties change under um, different disease or uh, conditions or exposure to drugs. Down the bottom, you can see a, uh, a map of the uh, um, a muscle stretching. Um, this is actually the application of that image registration algorithm that uh, we developed for skin mechanics being applied to getting a better understanding of the, uh, the movement and hence the mechanics of uh, these small muscles. That muscle here is really only uh, you know, two millimeters long, so you can get a scale for um, uh, 
you know, what we're dealing with here. We can keep these muscles alive for many, many hours at a time while we're doing uh, um, rather complex experiments on them. And the other, finally, the, 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 the last uh, um, area that I wanted to mention is in um, prosthetic limbs, or more generally, um, the development of soft actuators and sensors. Um, the reason this sort of comes under um, uh, soft tissue mechanics is because soft actuators are one of the few areas where you can get nice interactions between machines and living tissue. So we've been putting a lot of work into the development of uh, soft actuator arrays um, that can interact nicely with, for instance, um, the um, stumps of uh, amputee victims, um, providing a liner between the skin and the prosthetic limbs so that they can dynamically change the fit, the pressure distribution in response to changes in the stump geometry or even the activity that the uh, individual has been uh, is engaged in. And in order to solve that problem, we have developed some very interesting um, uh, length transducers that can, based on the uh, um, absorption of light, that can be incorporated into the actuators and thereby provide very accurate and fast uh, feedback of the configuration of these soft actuator arrays. The idea here is that we're going to be able to create new prosthetic limbs that can uh, better respond to the uh, activities that a person is, uh, is doing. So if you're sitting down, for instance, you don't need your prosthetic limb to be tightly coupled to your stump. Whereas if you get up or go running, then you want that to uh, actually uh, hold on tightly and perhaps even reposition itself automatically. So um, just that was a very, very brief uh, um, sort of overview of the, uh, the work that we're doing in uh, soft tissue mechanics in the, um, uh, in the lab and also on the modeling side. Um, there are many, many uh, opportunities for interesting research that can combine modeling, experimentation, and instrumentation development, um, or you know, some sort of mix uh, uh, of those with an emphasis perhaps on modeling or an emphasis on instrumentation development. If you're interested in any of these projects, um, then I would uh, hope that you could uh, contact uh, Prasad, Marty, or me um, to further discuss that. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Prasad. I think uh, Alice has joined us as well. Alice, are you there? Like to say? Yes. Like to say a few words. To start my video, I'm sorry, I missed the start of the session. So I'm the associate director postgraduate for the ABI. So I've kind of jumped in at the end in case there's any questions about kind of admissions or requirements or degrees at ABI. I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question. Do you have to be a, a BME graduate to come to ABI? No, you can, um, we have people working here from all sorts of backgrounds. My um, undergraduate and PhD degrees were in mathematics actually. So um, personally, I'm not from a BME background. Um, we have students and staff members with backgrounds in biomedical sciences, physiology, bunch of different types of engineering, physics, maths. So lots of opportunities depending on your skills and interests. There's often projects that involve a little bit of experimental work with a little bit of computational work and um, there's always projects available for all sorts of people. And Nina, if you want to do a PhD in instrumentation, I'd be very happy to supervise you. Thank you, Paul. I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a question there. Alice, do you want to answer that one? Do you see that? Oh, sorry. I'll hmm. put it in the... Uh... 
So um, what opportunities are there in all these groups for summer student research? Mm -hmm. We have someone that's a second year BME student who is really interested in getting involved. Excellent timing. Um, mm -hmm. the, every year we have a number of um, summer studentships. Um, they usually go for about 10 weeks over the summer. Um, and there's um, scholarships available and those summer studentships are normally advertised around this time of year. I think around a month from now, there'll be a list of projects coming out, maybe even less than a month from now. And um, you can apply pretty soon for those. Um, and every year we have several summer projects available. And again, we have summer students that come from a, a whole bunch of different backgrounds. Great, thank you. That was a good question. Any other questions? Good opportunity to ask them now. Nina, did you want to say something else? Oh, uh, there was question just there. one quick question there first, maybe. Yeah. Opportunity mentioned about new robots for effective therapies. What sort of profile are we looking for? Mm. Is that Brian, was that in your? Um, yep, that was in my talk. Uh, I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean by profile. Feel free to unmute yourself. And <laughs> I guess the background, uh, the, the educational background. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of students, I think uh, for that project, a bit of a biomedical background is better, but uh, I think otherwise, engineering, you know, mechanical engineering, mechatronics are good. Uh, you know, other engineerings we can, we can talk about and work with, but, uh, you know, that project will require developing a fair, fair amount of knowledge about biomechanics and rehabilitation. One thing that I guess is a good general point of advice for everyone is you do a tremendous amount of learning of new things while you're doing a PhD. Nobody comes into a PhD having picked up all of the skills that they need while they're an undergraduate. So don't feel like a project that might be a little bit of a stretch for you is out of reach. In many cases, there's actually no one who learns these things in their undergraduate program. And the only way to learn it is to try it out in post-grad. I'll echo that and um, I'll note that things like summer scholarships and even master's degrees are a good way to try those new things out and edge towards that new area without having to necessarily commit to a three year, four year PhD. Great, seems like we answered that question, that's good. Any other questions? Well, I can just add in terms of moving forward, whilst we've been sitting here listening to attentively to uh, our speakers, we have now been told that we will officially from midnight tonight move to alert level one. Um, so that means um, back to more, more, even more normality. So that as you know, Institute Operations Manager, I'm very delighted to be able to um, invite more of you to actually come physically on site. So uh, moving forward, we will follow up with more physical type of seminars. Um, so I definitely want to encourage everyone that's here today and pass it on to your friends as well uh, to keep an eye out for our events uh, as we're wanting to obviously be able to showcase even more of our research so you can actually physically see what it's like to actually be part of our group here at ABI. So watch this space. Excellent. Oh, was there another question? Is there a place where I can talk in person about the possibilities and requirements to apply? Yes. Yeah. Um, we could share the, Alice, you want to just share the uh, email address where they can contact us on into the chat? Okay, I'll do that. Yep. Another question. Do you expect any difficulties in student visa applications? Due to well, COVID? I actually received an email from immigration today. So they're obviously back in business a bit more than what they have been. 
Um, it's always hard to say when it comes to with immigrations. Um, it's uh, if you're already in the country, then you know we're hoping that that's obviously um, a benefit. Um, it's it's more obviously if you're still external. Obviously, our borders are still closed. That's that's more the tricky part. But if you're already in the country, then uh, that would definitely ease the process. Yeah, so I've just added into the chat, for those that can see the chat, um, an email address to contact. Um, if you want to speak to somebody more, we can exchange emails or organize a Zoom or hopefully into the future actually meet up physically with people to talk more about the projects and the opportunities available. Excellent. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, maybe we can wrap it up. Thanks again for everyone for uh, popping in. And uh, yeah, feel feel free to get in touch with anyone that's uh, spoken today or Alice or yeah, in the future. And I hope to see you all soon.